Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is taken from Revelation chapter 16, verses 6 through 12. And it reads, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the reading of the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Joshua and Oasis for reading that wonderful scripture. And that's one of the cornerstone scriptures of our church, the three angels message. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, today, uh, we have the privilege of having Pastor Ian Sweeney, who will bring us the word of God. Just a little bio, a brief bio of his ministry. Following his ministerial studies at Newbold College in England and accepting the call to the ministry, Pastor Sweeney entered pastoral work in 1989 at the Manchester South Seventh-day Adventist Church in Manchester, England. Pastor Sweeney enjoyed 18 years serving as a local pastor until 2008 when he was called to serve as president of the North England Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Three years later, he was asked to serve as president of the British Union Conference. After 11 years of service, in that role, and three weeks after being reelected to serve a third term, he was asked to serve as a field secretary of the General Conference, the Trans European Division. You remember him preaching last year, right here at Mitchellville in the Zoom, of course. And at that time, he was president of the British Union Conference. Now he is secretary. Uh, one of the secretaries in the trans european Division of the General Conference. You know, with the rate at which he is being promoted, I think uh, very soon, within the next five years, we may say, 
Welcome to the neighborhood, Pastor Sweeney. You know, he, um, there, he's already at a general conference in Europe. They may move in down to Silver Springs, right in our neighborhood. Pastor Sweeney, we're looking forward to see you and your wife in the next few years, right here in Maryland. I must add that uh, Pastor Sweeney uh, was our pastor, my, myself, Camille, and Tanasha, while I was studying in England there at the University of Manchester between 1989 and 1991. Uh, when I started studying, that's the year he started his ministry as a pastor. Pastor Sweeney enjoys uh, speaking on various topics and issues, and his passion and love uh, for preaching, evangelism, and being a church pastor has resulted in invitations to speak at evangelistic meetings and events extensively throughout the British Isle and across the globe. Pastor Sweeney and his wife, Jennifer, will celebrate 35 years of marriage in August. Congratulations, Pastor Sweeney, for that wonderful milestone. 35 years is a long time, longer than many of us were alive. Amen. Uh, they have three adult children, Jonathan, Joshua, and Joanna. His hobbies are caring for his two freshwater tropical aquariums, also walking and cycling. You may recall, as I said, Pastor, when he preached here last year on the Zoom, uh, he preached on stewardship. And the topic was, it's all about the money. Today, it focuses on religious liberty. And the topic, well, I, it's in the bulletin. I, I'll let him introduce that topic to you when he speaks. Pastor Sweeney, I welcome you and the Bishop of Seventh-day Adventist Church, though virtually. Pastor Sweeney uh, texted me this morning and said he was a little under the weather. And, you know, I think you heard the spring, spring pray about for him there. Uh, we, we will continue to pray for you and your family, uh, that the Lord will uh, keep you healthy and grant you healing as he wishes all of us to have. Let's pray for Pastor Sweeney as he brings the word. After the music of meditation, you'll hear from Pastor Ian Sweeney, Field Secretary of the General Conference, Trans-European Division. Hear ye him.
Amen and amen. I would like to uh, thank uh, Pastor Moyes um, for this kind invitation for me to be here, albeit via Zoom. And uh, it, it is a wonderful uh, privilege on my part to, to be here. I, I trust that this microphone will be able to pick up my voice, what's left of it, because of the uh, dreaded COVID. And I would also pray that Elder Paul Johnson is a false prophet. Um, I love visiting America, but as I jokingly say, um, you are in Adventist understanding of scripture, the lamb-like beast. And um, Britain, to my knowledge, isn't in scripture in that same way. Um, we're part of the toes and all of that, but I I'll leave you all to the lamb-like beast, if that's all right. <laughs> Today, I just want to try and uh, deal with a subject which I've entitled Chant Down Babylon. Chant down Babylon. And I pray that that you are blessed and indeed challenged uh, through the message that, that the Lord has just laid upon my heart for this time. You know, persecution on grounds of religious faith is a global phenomenon that is growing in scale and intensity. Reports, including that of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, suggest that religious persecution is on the rise, and it is an ever-growing threat to societies around the world. Though it is impossible to know the exact numbers of people persecuted for their faith, based on reports from different NGOs, it is estimated that one third of the world's population, one third of the world's population suffers from religious persecution in some form with Christians being the most persecuted group. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change one's religion or belief and freedom to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. The two young ladies who read Revelation 14, 6 through 12 so beautifully, you know, that passage of scripture, as Elder Paul has said, you know, is related to religious liberty because it is a call to all humanity to make free will choices, a free will choice to choose Christ, a free will choice to choose the enemy, a free will choice, Revelation 18, 4, a little later, to leave Babylon. The Seventh-day Adventist church strongly believes in religious freedom for all people. A person's conscience, not the government, should dictate his or her choice to worship or not to worship. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have long understood that our unique mission and identity springs from Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages. We are so linked to Revelation 14, 6 through 12, that our mission statement declares, and I'm just going to read our mission statement. I know you know it, but our mission statement declares that our purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. That's our mission statement, to proclaim the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages. But in many parts of the world, Adventism is struggling. Adventism is struggling in, in seeking to have the three angels' messages as being relevant to, to today and the life that we live in 2022. We and many of our members might be satisfied in focusing upon future 
events, but we have it certainly in the British Union, many young people in the, in the trans-European division, many young people in our congregations who are saying, that's fine about talking about the three angels' messages, but what is the church doing to show its relevancy today? Focusing, as some do, upon the Roman Catholic Church and focusing upon apostate Protestantism as being a future threat is all well and good. But today, one third of the world's population is suffering some kind of persecution. And, and, and the young people are saying in, in our division, with violence on our street, with young people, people dying all too prematurely and violently. Our Adventist young folk want to know, how does our church address the multitude of social and so social issues, which include religious persecution, mental health, racism, hunger, sexism, poverty, inequality, etc.? But I believe that there is an alignment with the three angels' messages and the contemporary issues that we face in our world today. In fact, in seeking to, to find this alignment between the three angels' messages and contemporary life, it might be helpful if we were to read and understand the passage a little differently. You know, in our message statement, we read it sometimes or interpret it as three angels with three messages. That is true. But I wonder if we can justifiably read it as three angels angels with one message. Certainly the author of these messages was one and only God. So it is one message delivered by three angels. If, and I recognize for some it is a big if that requires greater scrutiny of the Greek and the book of Revelation in its totality, but if it is understood as one message, it might change our subconscious habit of choosing to focus upon one message in preference to the others. So when we read Revelation 14, 6 through 12 as one message, we might move away from choosing message of the number one angel over the message of number two angel. When we read as one unified message, we must view the message in its totality, not as us having our preferred message, whether it's number one, two, or three, and ignoring those that are seen as somewhat embarrassing or certainly not politically correct. And so in looking at Revelation 14, 6 through 12 as one message, the big picture that we see is of a God bringing judgment upon a corrupt religious system and its followers. And in my view today, this is good news. This is news that we should share in all our societies across the globe. Judgment is good news, particularly when it is God doing the judging because he always gets it right. I, you don't need me to remind you, but when former police officer Derek Chauvin was convicted for the murder of George Floyd, there was a collective sigh of relief, not only in the United States, but right across the globe. Why? Because people said justice was at last being seen to be served. However, for those who are old enough, you might remember March the 3rd happened to be my wife's birthday, March the 3rd, 1991, that the LA Police Department pulled over a motorist by the name of Rodney King. Four officers beat the man senseless, kicked him merciless, mercilessly. The incident was filmed. The footage went viral. The four officers went to court, having been charged with using excessive force in the arrest. The jury acquitted 
all four police officers, which led to the LA riots. That's why the message of the three angels is good news, because it is about the justice of God who calls to accountability a corrupt system which has gotten away with injustice for too long. It is good news and nothing to be embarrassed about because judgment is in the hands of a God who is not subject to unconscious bias or prejudice in any of his rulings. That's the first reason we can preach this message. A second reason we can preach it today as we look for an alignment of the three angels' messages and the contemporary issues of our society today. And again, I wonder if Adventism would allow the interpretation of Revelation 14, 6 through 12 to be expanded a little. Now, before you conclude me as being apostate, according to the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, it, it reads, apparently toward the close of the first century AD, Christians were already referring to the city and empire of Rome by the cryptic title Babylon. By that time, and you see that in 1 Peter 5.13, the Bible commentary says, by that time, the once magnificent literal city of Babylon lay almost, if not altogether, in ruins, an uninhabited waste, and thus a graphic illustration of the impending fate of mystical Babylon. Now, as you can see from my bold head, I've never been a Rastafarian, and if I even wanted to become a Rastafarian, too late for me to grow locks. But, but, but I've, you know, I, I, I wasn't always listening to Jim Reeves, Pat Boone, and the like. And, and growing up in, in British uh, culture, I grew up, and I have to say, I listened to certainly the music of Bob Marley, whom some of you might remember, and, and he actually wrote a song, Chant Down Babylon. And, and I listened to the music of big youth. And, and as I was growing up as a teen, listening to this music out of the earshot of my father, who would have beat me senseless, growing up in the 70s and 80s and in, in Britain, which under the time had our first female prime minister by the name of Margaret Thatcher, the police during the 70s and early 80s were often referred to by people of color such as myself as Babylon. So when you saw the police, we would say, see Babylon coming. For the Rastafarian, however, Babylon was more than just the police. It referred, for the Rastafarians, Babylon referred to the, refers to the corrupted capitalist colonial world from which the righteous are trying to escape. That's how the Rastafarians understood it. And so for my parents, who came from a little island called Antigua in the late 1950s to England, which they considered the motherland, not Africa, England, as part of what we is termed the Windrush generation uh, because of the ship, the HMS Windrush, which brought a number of emigrant um, immigrants from the West Indies and Jamaica and so on to the United Kingdom. So when my parents came in the late 1950s to England as part of this early immigration generation Windrush, my parents responded to the invitation to help rebuild a post-Second World War England. Having been invited, they came to England, the motherland. They were confronted with prejudice, with, prejudice, with racism, with inequality. And so, for example, in trying to find lodging in 1950s, 60s, you know, United kingdom england they were greeted with signs which were just out there no blacks no irish no dogs my father being both black and having an irish father was excluded on two the dogs were still back home in antigua you we 
folk of this generation were confronted with prejudice, racism, and inequality. And then when they had their children, first generation children in the UK, such as myself, we then became the scapegoats for much that has gone wrong in British society. So I say this to make a point. Even as first century Christians would call Rome, the city of Rome, Babylon, could we be permitted to expand with a secondary contemporary interpretation of Babylon being those places and systems which display similar characteristics of a long gone ancient power known as Babylon. Indulge me in my speculation for a moment longer. You know the story of the three, should I say, four Hebrew boys. And in Daniel chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, because of course Daniel and Revelation have a symmetry, we read, let me drink this water. In Daniel 1, 6 and 7, we read, among those chosen were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all of whom were from the tribe of Judah. The chief official gave them new names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, you know, we know, and many preachers have acknowledged what the Babylonians were seeking to do in changing the Hebrews' names. But this ancient story still has a very contemporary relevance. Some of you, when you aren't just watching Hope Channel and 3ABN, some of you may know of an actress by the name of Tandy Newton. And she has been known, she's a British actress, and she's been known by this anglicized version of her name for many decades. Now, however, she has reverted back to the original spelling of her name, saying, to quote her, that she is taking back what is mine. You see, after the W was missed from the credit of her first role, acting role, Newton's mother is from Zimbabwe, and her shown name means beloved. Tandy, or is no longer credited as Tandy Newton, but Tandyway Newton. She's claimed back her African name. You see, we have members in our congregation in the United Kingdom, and I recognize that things may be different in the United States. So, so forgive me, Pastor, for, for speaking in the context of what I know. But, but in, we have members in our congregation whose name prevents them from getting a job. Why? Because the Babylonian system today is still interested in names. So research was carried out by academics based at Oxford University, and it re revealed that British citizens from ethnic minority backgrounds have to send, on average, 60% more job applications to get a positive response from employers compared to their white counterparts with more anglicized names. Do you hear what I'm saying? So they sent the University of Oxford, they sent 3,200 fake job applications for various kinds of jobs, including chefs, shop assistants, accountants, software in, uh, engineers, etc. In response to the adverts on a popular recruitment site, all of the fictitious candidates had identical CVs had identical covering letters, had identical years of experience. The only thing that they changed was the applicant's name. While 24% of white British applicants with 
angry, anglicized names received a call back from UK employers, only 15% of ethnic minority applications received a call back. You see, some of the big picture themes and characteristics of Babylon are not just history that ended with the overthrow of Babylon by the Medo-Persian Empire. Some of the big picture themes and characteristics of Babylon are not just about a religious persecuting power of 1260 prophetic days, Big picture themes and characteristics of Babylon are not just about persecution in days to come. There are many parallels in our day right now in, in other systems and powers of our day. And that's why the three angels' messages should be preached with power and conviction because Babylon is greater than sometimes the way we have interpreted it to be. Let me go on. At this point, you're not going to be happy with me. In seeking alignment of the three angels' messages with life today, I believe that our historical interpretation of who Babylon is should lead us to address more powerfully who we are as Seventh-day Adventists in our interpretation of Revelation. You see, we have folk, and we have certainly within Adventism ministries that are that are doing very well in chanting down Babylon. And there are members who who, who believe that what we should be doing much, much more of is chant down Babylon. We should be speaking more that, that Babylon is fallen. Now, now, I agree with that. However, when I want to chant down Babylon, when I as an Adventist want to declare that Babylon is fallen, it must be done so humbly or humbling, humbly acknowledging that as a Seventh-day Adventist, I am part of a Laodicean church that makes God want to vomit and spit us out. Hello. I want to chant down Babylon. Babylon is fallen. That's fine. But I've got to acknowledge as an Adventist that I'm part of a Laodicean church that makes God want to throw up. That's what Revelation 3.16. So, so when I chant down Babylon and say Babylon fallen, I've also got to recognize who I'm a part of. You see, in seeking alignment of the three angels' messages for issues of today, I believe that, that our Adventist historical interpretation of who Babylon represents should not only lead us to confront the uncomfortable history of Roman Catholicism, it should also lead us to confront our own uncomfortable Adventist history. And sadly, at times, we, this church, which I love and I'm so proud and honored to be a part of, but sadly at times, we have not the Seventh-day Adventist church, we're chanting down Babylon, we're telling, come out of Babylon, my people, but sadly at times, we have not come out of the practices and the ideology of fallen Babylon. Don't believe me? One such occasion was demonstrated in 1994. After years of hostilities and hate speech, Rwanda's Hutu majority people set out to annihilate the Tutsi minority. According to figures from several organizations, in just 100 days, about 800,000 people were killed and millions were displaced. 
Rwanda at the time, and to, still today, is among one of the most Christian countries in Africa. And in, 1990, and in the 1994 genocide, church buildings became one of the primary killing grounds, and Rwanda's churches and leaders consistently allied themselves with the state Babylon and played ethnic Babylon politics. You know, as the violence escalated, an Adventist mission president, an Adventist president of one of our missions, our conferences, who was a Hutu, urged his Tutsi members, as well as others, to take shelter in the Mugonero Adventist compound to which around 3,000 people sought sanctuary. April the 15th, 1994, heavily armed Hutu bands and members of the Presidential Guard circled the Adventist compound in pickup trucks. A group of seven Tutsi Seventh-day Adventist pastors who were in the church compound. They signed, wrote and signed a desperate letter to the president who was seen with the militia men as they circled the Adventist compound. They wrote a letter appealing for the president to intervene. The next day, which was Sabbath, the answer came at approximately nine o'clock, which was early for Sabbath school, when the militia men entered the Adventist compound with guns and machetes and methodically and systematically killed everyone taking shelter in the Adventist church, school, and hospital. The Adventist compound, this Adventist compound was the site of possibly the worst single massacre in the entire 1994 genocide. In a single day, almost all of the 3,000 Tutsis who had gathered at the Adventist mission were slain, some 2,000 inside the Adventist church building itself. The president, along with his son, a medical doctor, were later charged and imprisoned on war crimes. Now, I share this not to bash Africa or Rwanda or Hutu Adventism or, or anything like that, but I share this to help us to see that coming out of Babylon is to reject all the demonic ideologies and thought patterns of Babylon. I, I share this to humbly plead that we as a people of God would live different from Babylon, that we would align ourselves to God and not to the thought patterns and practices of Babylon. You see, the message of the three angels is a rejection of enforcement of religious and ideological beliefs. It is a rejection of the use of violence to reach any end. The message of Revelation 14, 6 through 12 is not only about what is happening in the Vatican, what is happening in America, what is happening in Europe. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 also addresses what is happening in our local communities and challenges us to speak, to cry loudly, and lift up the causes and the principles of Jesus Christ. Chant down Babylon, come out of Babylon, yes, but it is also this which has a message for today and the world in which we live today. And I was so inspired by what I heard in the Sabbath school, in the, in the depictions that the children and the adults did. Absolutely fantastic. You see, as I close, God does not force anyone to worship him. But the devil doesn't work by the same strictures. He will force us knowing that in our compliance, we will join him in the lake of fire. But today, 
And that's what religious liberty is about. It's the freedom to choose. Allow your conscience to choose. And so I say today is decision day. Remember this. Remember this. Knowledge about the Pope's movement will not save us in days to come. Some of us know more what the Pope is doing than what Elder Ted Wilson is doing. Knowledge about the Pope's movement is not going to save us, but rather our love, our commitment, and our loyalty to serve God. What is coming is frightening, but the reality is Christians are suffering today. Just because it isn't me suffering doesn't mean to say that another brother or sister who is suffering, I have to be ambivalent or indifferent about. What we are to face is going to be frightening, but God never made the promise to always keep his children out of trouble. God never promised that we would not be hunted, persecuted, or killed, but he did. God did say in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. Before the Lord your God goes with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. God's promise is that he will be with us through everything. Jesus has promised that he will never leave us, never forsake us. And for that, with my half gone voice, I say, hallelujah. When the night is the darkest, because we have freedom to worship, I say worship him because Jesus declares, I'll be with you. When the pain seems more than we could ever bear, worship him because Jesus declares, I'll be with you. When stones are being thrown at us, when Bullets are being shot at us. I declare worship him because Jesus declares, I'll be with you. When all hope has apparently gone, Jesus declares, I'll be with you. When you are thrown into the fire, Jesus declares, I'll be with you. When a loaded gun is placed at your temple, worship him because Jesus said, I'll be with you. When you have no food to feed your family because you refuse to compromise your faith, worship him because Jesus said, I'll be with you. When you're being thrown into a prison cell because of your faith, worship him because Jesus said, I'll be with you. I cry hallelujah because Jesus said, I'll be with you. Hallelujah. One day soon, Jesus is coming back. Let's tell the world, let's reach the world with the wonderful message that God has entrusted to us. May God bless us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sweeney. I have to say COVID did not get anything on you at all. May God heal you and kick that virus out of your system and heal your family as well. Thank you for the message. Pastor Sweeney, and um, I hope that it inspires us to move on, to move forward with the word of God. As we culminate the celebration of Black History Month, we are reminded that all of us stand on the shoulders of those Black men and women 
who sacrificed everything for the basic human right to be free. Freedom is an interesting phenomenon. It is freedom from something and freedom to do something. In the case of Black America, it is freedom from oppressive forces that prevent full actual, actualization of personhood. For our ancestors, it was primarily freedom from slavery. In contemporary America, or until recently, freedom has come down to having the freedom to study American history without whitewashing, the right to vote, and the freedom to fulfill our dreams or, or, or the dreams of our families. Real freedom allows all of us to pursue our aspirations and goals with hope and meaning. However, freedom costs. Each of us must decide what we are willing to give up or contribute to the quest for freedom. Like our fourth parents paid the price of slavery so that we can experience freedom today, Jesus paid the price with his blood so that we may be eternally free. Today, as a church, we have the opportunity to make a sacrifice through our giving so that our brothers and sisters near and far can experience the freedom that exists in knowing Christ. I invite you today to demonstrate your freedom through the giving of your resources and of yourselves to the master. Let us give sacrificially of our tithes and our offering. God is counting on our accountability. We have the opportunity to express our freedom by giving in three ways. Online, you can go to the Mitchellville's website and the, click on the online giving tab and the instructions are there for you to give electronically. You can also use the option to give by mail and that would be through our PO box number 6599 Largo, Maryland 20792. And um, we, those of us who are here, as the spirit moves, feel free to give to the cause of God. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Shall we pray? Dear God, Today, we are thankful for the message that we've received. We are thankful for the songs that we were blessed by. And Lord, we, were, we are very thankful that we have experienced health and the songness of mind. We were able to labor and we were able to earn. And we are thankful for the freedom we have to give to your cause. We ask that you bless each of us and help us to continue to give so that men and women can learn about you and your coming can be hastened. Continue to watch over us and continue to provide for us, continue to strengthen us so that we can continue to support each other and to support the mission of this church. Bless us to this end we pray with thanks in Jesus name. Amen. At this time, we will.
At this time, we will stand for our closing hymn, The Lord is Coming, hymn 200. In our hymn books, The Lord is Coming, let this be the herald note of Jubilee. The Lord is Coming, let this be the herald note of Jubilee. And when we meet and when we part, the salutation from the heart. The Lord is coming, let this be the herald note of Jubilee, the herald note of Jubilee. The Lord is coming, sounded forth from east to west, from south to north. Speed on, speed on. time we spent in your presence we are grateful we're thankful for the music for the various ways we, we praise you today we were especially thankful to remind that we need to come out of Babylon that that call is for us may we hear and may we answer your call in our lives in our every interaction that we can show that we are following you listen to your word Bless us today and bless us throughout this week and help us in our interactions that we may reflect you in every way. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Amen. I'd just like to make a few remarks of thank you at this time. I'd like to thank all the participants uh, in today's service for making this service such a wonderful service. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our young people who did such a beautiful job, um, our pathfinders and our young people in the Sabbath school program. Wonderful, really fresh and exciting and exhilarating. I'll also, uh, finally, I'd like to thank Pastor Ian Sweeney uh, for his wonderful message. And I'll also like to thank his wife, Jennifer, uh, for, uh, for allowing him to be preaching so many times. You know, he sometimes preach in the morning and then preach in the evening. Right now it's in the evening in England. Uh, thank you, Pastor Sweeney, for such a wonderful message. Chandong Babylon. You know, I remember that song when I was growing up as a teenager, Bob Marley. 
But we chant down Babylon one more time for themselves. Yes, but the message, the way you presented and interpreted the message of revelation for today, so new and fresh, the way we should look at Babylon. It is not just the Roman Catholic system. It is even a wider system that the enemy is using against God's people. God bless you, Pastor Sweeney. And thank you very much. May the Lord continue to bless your ministry. And I know he will get, grant you full healing and you and your family members from this COVID uh, infection. God bless. And thank you all here in the congregation and all on Zoom for being a part of this service. God bless us all. Amen.